I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that you probably have a friend or maybe even multiple friends named Josh. And I would challenge you to take a look at your yearbook, maybe from high school, uh, contacts list on your telephone, maybe your Facebook friends list. And I'm sure you would come up with a couple Joshes. But none of those Joshes, no matter how good of a friend and or family they might be, they will not be as cantankerous or impetuous or challenging to love as our dear friend Josh E. And you're like, Steve, what's Josh E? Well, I'm talking about the fix that is in Sector 8 on the southwest corner of the island of Puerto Rico. Today, we are going to be talking about all things Josh e. I figured that such a tricky fix warranted its own presentation. Now, we've covered vectoring before in great detail in a couple of these videos. We've vectored for just about every possible situation. But today's presentation is going to be unique because of the unique challenges that the Joshi area presents to the controller, whether you're a trainee developmental just starting out on the floor, starting your scenarios downstairs in the lab, or a seasoned CPC of many years, it always has something for everybody. And we're going to go over what exactly it has in store for you and what you have to look forward to when you sit down to an R2 and R8 session. So I am really excited about today's presentation because the format is kind of open-ended. We have covered vectoring, weather calls, clearances, crossing restrictions, all of these absolutely wonderful things we have covered in past videos. And what better way to tie them all in, to use all these tools and to apply them in the Joshi area. And it's no joke, all this stuff that you have learned, you will need to apply it in the Joshi area. And you're gonna see what I mean when we go to the subsequent slide. Steve here, thanking you so much, welcoming you back to this wonderful presentation. Thanks for spending some time with me today, talking shop, talking air traffic, the wonderful world that we live in where we get to talk to airplanes. So without further ado, let's get to the next slide and let's start talking about how Joshi situations can be negotiated with some facts, figures, I will see you there, okay? title of today's bolted list is Bossy Joshi. And just like any boss, Joshi will distribute work, command your respect and attention, and hopefully cultivate your skill work as you make your way through the training process. That's our hope and prayer, right? As you know, when we start out these presentations, we like to give you the baseline facts, the facts and variables that you can make your decisions off of because you know the whole picture. And these elements do not change. Some of them are a little bit dynamic, but for the most part, these are constant known things. And you'll see what I mean just in a second. Starting off with number one, Lima 221, Lima 325, November 779, and San Juan Terminal Area Standard Arrival Routing, Maya Green 633, Route 12, San Juan, or Route 12, Joshi San Juan, all go through or transition to Joshi. So built in the very nature of San Juan Center's airspace, you have multiple airways and transitions transitioning and converging on Joshi. It's built in. So you already have the possibility of aircraft on all these different airways possibly being a factor for each other as they make their way to Joshi. More on that in a minute. As you see today, this is a sidebar and side note, we do not have a radar video map. A cutout of the low altitude chart from Sky Vector, I think was a little bit more prudent and illustrious because it shows you, at least if you look closely, uh, the distances associated with the respective airways from Joshi. Obviously not the entire route structure from where they start at the boundary, but the area where you're probably gonna get some of the vectoring done and where the ideal geographical area where the vectoring should be done by the time you formulate your plan and so on. So, there it is, Joshi is highlighted, and you have all the airways associated there too. Crossing restriction, the nature of the crossing restriction due to its proximity, Joshi's proximity to the San Juan area, especially when we're talking the ILS or RNAV runway eight and uh, ILS and RNAV runway one zero approaches at San Juan, you don't have a lot of room between Joshi and those initial approach fixes. So naturally it is built into the SOP that the crossing altitude is lower than all of our other gates, but also the speed is lower than all of the other gates, seven and 210, as opposed to just about every other air, uh, 
area is 11 and 250. Also note, the restriction is the same for props and jets, unlike uh, Bino and Sailor, where you have the option to have 9,000 for props and 1,000 1, for your jets. Vetus is the same way as Joshi. There's no 9,000 for props at Vetus. It's 11 for everybody. So this makes it a little bit tricky for when you have mixed aircraft types. Area is prone to bad weather. You will learn that there will always seems to be a thunderstorm that occurs during your day shift over Joshi. It starts out as a couple clouds and then it starts appearing on the radar scope and then it just grows, gets some lifting activity associated with it. And next thing you know, there's a giant thunderstorm that stretches between Joshi all the way southeast to like Gambo. So it's really, very interesting that you can almost account for a thunderstorm whenever you work it in. Just so happens to be it occurs in the afternoon, right when Joshi gets bumping with aircraft transitioning to San Juan from South America and Central America. Vectoring is made tricky by multiple routes, airports, restricted areas, two head-on SIDs, and a high MVA due to mountainous terrain. You have the cards stacked against you whenever you have to vector for Joshi. It is not like we are able to vector these aircraft over vast cavernous spaces of open ocean water, right? The fine Atlantic Ocean when we are talking about Bino, Sailor, even Vetus to an extent. Joshi is over land. There's a high MVA, 6,600 due to mountainous terrain. You have multiple airports, Barincon, Mayaguez, and Ponce. The two head-on SIDs, if there's a release off of Ponce, you're talking the Wilfred II departure. If you have to vector aircraft far to the east to make your sequence work, you have to worry about not only restricted area 7103, yet again another obstacle, but you have to worry about if there's a Gambo departure because the Gambo is basically mirroring, kind of tracing Route 9 there. So you have to be careful for head-on traffic situation there. What else? Uh, the routes. Route 4 cuts right through Joshi, and it's a transitional airway. Route 4 is how aircraft are able to navigate around the island or navigate around San Juan Terminal airspace. Route 4 perfectly does that. And it's a very useful airway because it hits a lot of points of interest. It's also a transitional airway to the high en route altitude structure at St. Croix. Aircraft will depart Barincon or overfly Barincon, join Route 4 and make their way to St. Croix where they can spread out and join the colored airway structure. So you have a lot of things going on right here. And with that 6,600 MVA, you don't have a lot of space because everybody is operating at or above that altitude. And your crossing restriction is 7,000. Not to mention that that 6,600 foot MVA extends into Approach's airspace, so Approach will not be able to descend your Joshi inbound aircraft right off the bat. So you have to worry about compression, where you have that luxury with compression over Sailor and Bino that approach, as soon as they take the handoff, they have control for turns and descent, that they're gonna drop that aircraft to 3,000. Well, that won't necessarily happen as fast as you'd probably like it to be at Joshi. So you have to consider that compression is going to stay compressing until they get past, the aircraft gets past the 6,600 foot MVA that extends into approaches airspace. So there's a lot of interesting things that make this an obstacle of sorts for you to get around. Now we talked about, uh, or we did not talk about restricted area 7105. What an obstacle that is. First, the restricted area has a little aerostat, right? That balloon-like structure, blimp thing. But the Powers at B put a 16,000 foot MVA to protect the airspace around the aerostat. So now you have to worry or miss that area when vectoring. And guess what? With that 16,000 foot MVA associated with it, you have to be sure that if you're planning on vectoring an aircraft to anywhere in the vicinity of that high MVA or the restricted area, that you don't descend that aircraft any lower than 16,000 feet. And that's tricky because of its proximity to Joshi. If you're gonna keep an aircraft suspended at 16,000 feet, vectoring around restricted area 7105 and its associated high MVA, well then you have to make sure that your plan is sound to account for the aircraft's descent to make any kind of restriction, the respectable restriction at Joshi at seven and 210. So you see, there's a lot of factors here. 
that are at play that can make this fix really, really irritable. Like I said, it's cantankerous and impestuous and all other kind of adverbs and adjectives to describe something very unpleasant. But you can make it pleasant. And we are. We're going to talk about this so you get through this intimidation factor. And sometimes in these presentations, I don't mean to build up any kind of drama or fear factor associated with these airways. No, if anything, that fear factor is already built in because you have witnessed it or you just understand these facts now. But guess what we're going to do? We're not going to leave you uh, alone on the wayside. We're going to tell you, hey, guess what? You can do this. I have faith in you. You can surely work out any kind of Joshi sequence. It'll be fantastic by the end of this presentation with some of the factors considered. So I have faith in you. So don't get all riled up over the intimidation factor. You got this. So the last point here kind of talking is it does require to have a well-formulated and executed plan for far, uh, from far out because of a couple other factors that make it difficult, not just the ones inside our airspace, but since a lot of the traffic that is going to land via Joshi, the aircraft are going to enter the airspace from Santo Domingo. As you know, we get the flight plan for aircraft 10 minutes prior to the Santo Domingo San Juan Center boundary. That's not a lot of time. We have 80 miles from our boundary, 80 miles from Maya, say, to have a plan worked out. And you can see how fast the plan can change. And we'll see that in a second when we go to the sector. But you can theoretically have an aircraft over Armour and Scapa landing San Juan by a Joshi via the respective airways. And you think all is well, all is calm, all is bright. And you get multiple flight plans from Santo Domingo landing San Juan via Joshi. And now, all of a sudden, where you had a plan worked out for maybe one aircraft, which is extremely easy, two, not so bad either. Now you add a third one in there, and now things don't seem quite as clear as they were before. And you thought you were home free. And then 10 minutes later, everything changes. Not to mention that sometimes Santa Domingo will not always comply with the LOA. Now this is not me trying to attack the Santa Domingo colleagues that we have to the island of Hispaniola, we're not talking about that. That's a different conversation for a different day. What I mean by that is sometimes they will not issue the crossing restriction altitude, wet level 310 at Sateau, level 250 at Maya. Sometimes they'll be descending. So now you have to work with getting these aircraft down to meet that Joshi restriction while formulating a plan and possibly having to vector with all of the things being considered that we covered in the bolted list above this one. So this can get difficult. So let's stop talking about it. Let's take a look at what a sector looks like, kind of a busy sector that is going to converge over Joshi. And let's talk this through. Methods, techniques, tips and tricks, the things that we like to talk about, these pleasant things that's going to have you negotiate this and coming out right on top. Let's do it. See the next slide, I believe we'll be at the sector. Ready, set, jets, go. To the sector, you have arrived. You plugged in, you took the relief briefing, you got your friend out, you got your bearings now, and now you are taking a look at what kind of work needs to be done. And what is there to meet you is a three-way tie, a sequence at Joshi. November 740, November Dell is on Lima 325. Copa 142 is on Lima 221. And JetBlue 2138 is on that green 633 segment of green 633 Mayanguez Route 12 to San Juan. You are worthy of this. This is something that you can do, and I have faith in you to do it. So, a couple of things to consider. Whether you just sat down right at minute number one, or you've been working for the past 25 minutes, there's very little you could have done to kind of make this plan or whatever plan we're going to talk about happen prior to this point. And what do I mean by that? As you see, most of these aircraft are all basically 80 to 95 miles out from Joshi. As you know, as we talked about in the last slide, you don't get flight plan information from Santa Domingo until 10 minutes from the boundary, roughly 80 miles. So Copa 142 and JetBlue 2138 were not even in the picture maybe 12, 15 minutes ago. So for a while there, the person you got out, and now it's you, you had no idea that JetBlue 2130 and Copa 142 existed. Because November 740 and November Delta came from Scapa, 
And for a while there, for maybe you know 20 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, that was the only aircraft you knew you had over Joshi. See how quickly the plan changed? And not only did the plan change quickly, but the room to make things happen, i.e. vector, to make this plan happen, whatever we're going to do, has been minimized. This is about the area where the decisions have to be made. This is almost the deadline, the cutoff point, say, hey, I need to have this figured out and let me have my plan in place by this area. Another complexity factor that doesn't happen over Bino and Sailor because you have flight plan information way out in advance for both of those respective fixes. So just another unique thing just to consider. So it's not your fault that we let the um, snowball get so large that we can't even control it. No, this is what we have to work with in the time frame and the parameters we have to play by, and by God, we're going to do that. So with that being said, determine who is first. Looking at the distances and looking at the trend of aircraft, Looks like JetBlue 2138 is my outlier. They're at a relatively respected altitude. They're also the slowest aircraft right now. My trend here is to see that two airways that approach Joshi from the south and south, southeast and southwest kind of add a natural flow. It's looking like these aircraft are not quite truly tied where they are exactly wanting to occupy Joshi at the same exact time down to the very second but it looks like Learjet 740 November Delta, they are kind of fast. They are reaching the lower limit of their altitude restriction, and they are also out in front. They are going to be my number one aircraft. I am going to consider some speeds, headings, and altitudes in mind given the circumstances. We'll talk about that in just a second there. But 740 November Delta looks like they fit very naturally tracking towards Joshi. Now, that's as direct as they can get. Saying direct Joshi for November 740 November Delta would be a waste of breath because that airway pretty much is pointed straight at Joshi. With that being said, I am not going to give direct Joshi to any other aircraft. Why? Because, one, to eat up some time, have them actually fly the extent of the airway. As you know, Copa 142 is not tracking towards Joshi right now. They're tracking towards Taog. And then after Taog, they'll track towards Joshi. And JetBlue, even though they're kind of pointed at Joshi, I might want to use my Iguez or any other kind of downline fix that exists on the airways to give a clearance. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So with that being said, my plan is to keep November 740, November Delta, number one. Copa 142 will naturally fall right behind. And the tricky, the vectoring aspect of this is going to be JetBlue 2138 to be number three. I am going to take JetBlue 2138 and give them a vector to fall behind Copa. So we'll talk about those headings in a second. So with that being said, Lear, 0 November Delta, cross Joshi is 7,000 and 210 knots, salmon altimeter 29999. If I really wanted to ensure some speed and make sure that I am ensuring that this aircraft stays as fast as possible until they approach Joshi, I would give a speed restriction in the descent, but we'll see how that works. Next is COPA. I'm going to reduce their speed. I'm going to pick an arbitrary number that I think a Learjet can maintain if I needed it, you're going to see here Copa 142 reduce speed to 280 knots, then cross Joshi at 7000 at 210 knots, sound altimeter 29999. And that works out because the 280 is something I know a Learjet can do. So if things start getting kind of precarious, compression starts sitting in, and Copa starts gaining on 0 November Delta, I can always tell November 0 November Delta to maintain 280, 290 knots or greater, and maybe you know, pass that along. JetBlue 2138, turn right 150 vector sequence to send and maintain 16,000, affect Joshi at 7,000 and 210 knots. Same one altimeter, 29999. It's a good transmission. What are you doing? First, you are stopping their forward progress, trekking towards Joshi. They're number three. They gotta go behind Copa at the very least. So a 150 heading is going to kind of parallel and keep that aircraft laterally separated from restricted area 7105, even though we're only dropping the aircraft to 16. We could probably drop in the seven on that heading, 
but let's just drop them to 16, start out with that, and we tell them what to expect. So with that being the case, JetBlue 2130 is going to turn toward the southeast and be pointed at the future position of Copa 142 with separation to spare. So it's going to be wonderful. JetBlue 2130 is going to turn to the southeast, fall behind Copa. Copa, depending on how they follow that speed restriction, will follow right behind November 7 for uh, zero November Delta. So not too bad here. It's kind of an easy plan. If you can see it, this is my plan. It's technique. It's my method. Um, surely we can get into a lengthy discussion on how we can make each aircraft first. And there is a way to do it. I promise you that. There are headings galore for days. But this is the way that I kind of figured would be good. So let's go to the next slide. Let's see how this formulates and let's keep this thing going. Wonderful. We've moved up into the future a little bit and here are a few things to consider. If needed, ACRAC no speed restriction for the front aircraft. That's a very useful thing. A 210 can be over restrictive. Sometimes the approach doesn't even like them at 210. Sometimes they like their good Joshi guys fast. So app rack 250 or no speed at Joshi for your first guy to keep them fast. We kind of alluded to this when we talked about if the 280 speed restriction would be ample for Copa because we know a Learjet can go 280 or greater, but maybe we want to keep them going fast all the way until Joshi until approach slows them down for the approach uh, segment of flight. If needed, we have to vector COPA 142 to the east, but remember, if we are going to vector them to that general direction as they're descending to 7,000, be cognizant of restricted area 7103 and what altitude it is active up and to. Remember that it can be either 6,000 or 12,000. If it's 6,000, you have nothing to worry about, but if it is 12,000, it is something to consider if you are going to vector an aircraft that far to the east. Hopefully you would not have to. You can have the sequence figured out, even vectoring to the east. Uh, hopefully the aircraft, your plan will not require them to fly that far east. And you see how JetBlue 2138's turn, descending them to 16, is going to fall right behind COPA. Now, one thing that we did not really talk about in the last slide, but one thing to consider, at any point in time, once you figure out your number one aircraft, the sequence that you want to see be played out, try to keep all the other aircraft on their respected airways. As you know, November 740, November Delta is going direct Joshi by virtue of the airway. To clear that aircraft direct Joshi is a waste of breath. Copa 142, they are not proceeding direct Joshi. They are flying direct Taog, then direct Joshi. Keep them going that way. And JetBlue, you vectored. But just remember, even if you were to give JetBlue a direct Joshi clearance, maybe they were before Copa or you wanted them to be number one, or you were just leaving them on the airway, keep them on the route because you might want to use a fix along their route of flight to make reference to. And what I'm saying is a 140 heading off the Maiguas VOR will have JetBlue 2138 be able to descend to 7000 and maintain the lateral separation restricted area 7105 and its high associated MVA. Another heading to consider. So just keep that in mind. And remember, as JetBlue 2138 falls behind Copa 142, know when to time up their turn back to Joshi. And know that they may have to stay at 16,000 until they pass restricted area 7105. And that is something very prudent to consider because think of it this way. JetBlue 2138 on their current trajectory, if we were to project and scan out into time, and follow the Lear lens where Copa 142 is going to be and JetBlue 2138 is going to be in an arbitrary amount of time, maybe two minutes, maybe four minutes. At that time, we don't want to waste no time for JetBlue 2138 to turn back on course to Joshi. We don't want them going just arbitrarily southeast for an extended amount of time. So remember that 16,000 feet wasn't so much for the vector because they are well clear of restricted area 7105 on a heading but realize they're not going to be on that heading forever. And your plan is to turn them back direct Joshi. So just remember that once you get the spacing that you feel comfortable with with these two aircraft, just remember that 16,000 feet, don't be tempted to give them Joshi at 7 and 210 whenever you think the sequence is over. Keep them at 16 until you are assured either the heading is now laterally, the new heading, direct Joshi, is laterally separated from 7105, or they have passed it and are over it and able to be given 7,000. 
So it's not a terrible descent. They are last in the sequence. You can always app rack descending because after they pass this restricted area to get down to 7,000 from 16,000 to lose 9,000 feet in roughly 40 miles, 35 miles, it might be hard for an E190, but nothing that you can't coordinate. So just keep that in mind. Remember, time up your turn and remember to keep watching out for restricted area 7105. It is a pesky obstacle whenever you are um, vectoring. So good job with that. Let's keep it rolling. Oh, what, what happened here? We had a good plan going. We were near the end of the plan, too. All we had to do was issue a couple of turns on course, monitor a little bit, babysit here, give a crossing restriction there. Uh, not so fast. We didn't go over that bulleted list not to have it be illustrated here and show you the potency of uh, the factors at play when dealing with the Joshi sequence. Now, obviously, this is a worst case scenario, but there are things at play here that would come up that will disrupt your Joshi sequence near the end of your Joshi sequence. When you think all is well and, hey, you're home free, well, things kind of show up. I mean, look at this. Watch out for, you know, your Ponce releases climbing to the top altitude on the Wilfred II departure. Now, we talked about this, that... When you have a Wilfred II departure and you possibly have Joshi traffic, leave them on the departure procedure. The departure procedure does a really, really good job of climbing the aircraft in a small lateral area that will keep them clear of Joshi. Chances are if you leave them on that procedure and let them climb as they crisscross and fly almost like a little square, you'll probably be fine. Something to consider for Barrington transitions on the Wilfred II departure. Watch out for traffic transitioning on Route 4. Look, we have an Amfly 8110 going to turn right to join Route 4, going southeast bound. And we have a Chasky 345 transitioning at 8,000 northwest bound on Route 4. Boy, something really to get in the way and ruin your day and ruin this sequence for sure. So keep in mind some of the things you're going to have to do. Remember, it's safer to keep aircraft flying at lower altitudes until they cross the traffic at Joshi. You can't avoid it. Route 4, Joshi is an intersection on that airway. It's a known thing. So what does that exactly mean? It might mean you have to either APRAC descending with approach for your Joshi guys, because 7 doesn't sound like a safe altitude here with Chasky transitioning at 8, or APRAC a higher altitude. Maybe you can get away with 9,000, maybe 8,000 if it wasn't for Chasky. And the approach controller, having that their map, their range, or their radar scope sees Joshi, they're probably going to know why you're asking for that. But something to consider. You might have to do that with these aircraft. Remember that if you're vectoring to the east, looking at you, Copa 142, watch out for aircraft climbing southbound on the Gambo SID. Route 9 departures too. And also watch out for restricted area 7103, which may be active to 12,000. Something to consider. Now, like I said at the beginning of this slide, this is like the worst case scenario. This is a beehive of activity that very seldom all happens at once. But believe me, when it does happen, just remember, you can assure separation with the RAL 2299, leaving them on the procedure and climbing them ever so carefully to make sure that you are maintaining uh, a safe operation and monitoring that. Gasky and Amflight, I really don't have instructions for you. Maybe climb them to a minimum altitude, 7,000. Maybe keep Chasky at 8 and think about having your Joshi guys cross the intersection at 9,000 and app racking it with approach. You can be dynamic. You can coordinate your way out of this. Don't try to make it work and don't try to do anything dicey. Just know that you have some tools in your back pocket, i.e. coordination, to be able to do this. So good job. Let's keep moving on. Ah, so we're a glutton for punishment here because we just put some weather over the Joshi area. That certainly is going to disrupt the sequence. Now think of it this way. You can surely try your best to be that referee call out the weather, approve deviations, and have these aircraft get into the San Juan terminal area in some kind of haphazard fashion. But think of it this way. Look at where the weather is. Look at where the weather is not. Move the area that you are sequencing for. And what do I mean by that? Try using the Boca gate. Boca, route two. 
There's no need to try to make Joshi work for the second two. Zero November Delta, they could probably be a trailblazer. See what the conditions are. Chances are this storm started growing when you sat down and it just recently started getting into that extreme um, you know, classification of weather. In November, in zero November Delta is out in front. Possibly you can have them DV to the east. You can make it happen. See what kind of conditions lie in there. Call out the weather to them and follow through properly with that, but know that it's probably going to be most efficient, given the distances in mind, to have Copa and JetBlue go over the Boca Gate or join Route 2 because of the lack of weather there, and you are able to have a more uh, a stronger sense of control of the situation as opposed to trying to deal with weather where the weather kind of trumps you because, well, because of the hazards involved with weather. Uh, stop having your aircraft trek towards Joshi via a vector to buy every one time for a sequence and reroute issuance, right? You have now moved the point of vectoring from Joshi and moved that sequence to possibly vectoring for Boca. So, what I mean by that is stop the forward progress of these aircraft converging and figure out immediately who's number one, who's number two, and on those vectors, that will give you time and the air crew time to comply and copy down your new clearance and any other restriction that you might have. So with that being said, JetBlue 2138 clearance, advise when ready, and then your next succeeding transmission, COPA 142, turn left heading 360, vector weather. And then give the weather to November Delta and possibly see what their intentions are going to be. November 740, November Delta, area monitored extreme precipitation, 12 o'clock, 4 or 5 miles moving west, tops and bases unknown, 1 7 miles in diameter. Area 1 7 miles in diameter. So perfect. Look at how that worked out. You now have JetBlue 2138 getting them locked and loaded for the clearance over Boca. And Copa 142, 360, they're going to fall behind JetBlue and then you'll be able to give them their clearance. So you see how this all works out. Now, if you wanted to, you can pause this and rewind it, knowing that we kind of went over the answers here, and you can practice. This is a nice radar flashcard for you if you're so inclined. So let's go to the next slide. Let's keep talking about this weather situation, and we'll figure it out. Back at the sector, some of the targets have started moving a little closer. Some have started following our command, and now is the perfect time and the opportunity for us to start these reroutes. So, Use Barink and Route 2 Boca San Juan to avoid weather at Joshi. Remember that you can cross Boca at 5 or 7, but you have to app rack your turbojets. That's the SOP right there. Things to consider. Why not give Boca right off the bat? Think of it this way. Where the aircraft are, Copa, JetBlue, and even November Delta. Think of this. If November Delta is not able to make it over Joshi and they have to go over the Boca gate, you can probably give them direct Boca if they are number one in the sequence. But think about how much easier it is to vector for Berinkin, sequence at Berinkin, and have the sequence done, spacing and shirt at Berinkin, as opposed to trying to get it at Boca. Look at where Boca is. You have Sector 6 to the north there. You have the weather to the south. You want to have everything figured out by Berinkin. And that actually gives you a lot of time because Brinkin's a lot easier to vector in this situation because you're not having to miss restricted area 7105 with either Copa, zero November Delta, depending on what heading you give. Maybe a 350 heading, a 360 heading will keep them clear of that if they do not want to proceed over that way. And now they fall in line with the natural succession. Whatever you want to do, just keep in mind that it's a lot easier to vector for a nav aid. Barinkin than it would be for Boca here with all these factors at play. Look at this triangle. You have the Barinkin class Delta, Sector 6, the weather, and restricted area 7105, all to make that happen with a direct. Now, an interesting factor at play here is you just took a handoff on a departure of Route 2 westbound, a Barinkin gate departure aircraft. And look, they're head on. Well, have no fear. There's a couple ways to do this. Try it this way. JetBlue 2138 clear to San Juan Airport via direct Barinkin Route 2 Boca direct. Cross Barinkin at or below 13,000, then cross Boca at maintain 7,000, San Juan Altimeter 2, 9999. Look at that, a double restriction. What does that restriction ensue? You could have gotten away with saying cross Boca at 7,000. Chances are they probably would have started descending. But now you have lit a fire under the proverbial butts 
of JetBlue 2138 to cross Barinkin, cross this area at 13, at or below 13, and then cross here at 7, which is good because guess what? I can imagine the climb rate on this Boeing 737-900, they will definitely be out of 13,000 prior to here. It's almost like using a non-radar restriction to help you out with some radar efficiencies. And it does work. Double restrictions are beautiful. Cross this area at below 13 and then cross here at 7. First off, it sets up a nice descent profile and they'll definitely be able to make this restriction having said that. Even if they can't make the Barankin restriction for whatever reason and they'll say we'll do our best, that's probably going to be good enough. We know we're not going to be able to vector United 668 to the south west but at the very least if we really think it's a factor point them out to r6 and let them fly on a northwest bound heading until they can make their way back to kate talk court if they're going to intercept but just remember a double restriction really helps and this is one of the first times we're able to introduce this concept to you guys so interesting just remember double restrictions awesome Use a double research to help alleviate head-on situations. This will make the altitude swap occur sooner rather than later. There it is. Oh, look, center to zero November delta needs left deviation. Oh, man, you have all this space out to the east. Why can't you go that way? Well, they need and they want to go left, of course, which is fine. There's nothing precluding us from giving that, um, allowing that restriction, or excuse me, allowing that deviation but remember, we have to respect Restricted Area 7105. That being said, if we're going to respect Restricted Area 7105, the 7110 in Chapter 2, when we're talking about weather, we can, first off, we could unable the request. But we're not going to do that. We can set a limit. We can restrict how many miles left, of course, the aircraft can fly. And that's exactly what we're going to do. November 0, November Delta, deviation not to exceed 10 miles left the course approved when able, clear direct tanner. You see how that works out? If you know you have to respect something, adjacent airspace, special use airspace, military airspace, TFRs, what have you, whatever you have to do, just know that you are able to limit the restriction. Now, if they come back and say they're unable that, they need more, well, then you'll have to enable it. And guess what they can have? They can have everything east of that storm system. They can have, they can go over Vetus for all we care. They can go over Gambo for all we care. But the idea is that if they are not able to make what you have available work, well, then just offer and be very courteous and offer another course of action, possibly to the right of course. Just know that that might happen. But just remember, we talked about these obstacles. And when you add weather, it truly is a maze and an obstacle course to get these aircraft into the San Juan area in a safe manner. We introduced the concept of the double restriction to help you out, not only in situations of Joshi, but when you also have turboprops landing the Boca gate, which you don't have to have rack, that's standard routing. You might have to use that. So great job with that today, guys. Really, really good job. I hope we were able to, yet again, take a small chunk out of that iceberg and explore how you were able to use logic, pre-plan methods and techniques to tackle a Joshi situation, knowing all the factors at play, knowing all the givens that are there at the start and constant throughout your career. I know some of the things that can happen, those possibilities, those worst case scenarios with the departures off the airports and weather and all that crazy stuff. I hope you take that all into consideration. As you see, we kind of refreshed ourselves with a little bit of chapter two right there with the weather, but mostly we stayed in chapter five, vectoring, speed control, all of those absolutely wonderful things, phraseology wise, that you can follow up in chapter five if you want to look up things further. Now, knowing what you know now, you can possibly go back into this PowerPoint, leave everything blank, and try out the phraseology yourself. You have a couple of radar flashcards here in the Joshi area, really uh, useful for you to have at it. So great job, I'll see you at the next slide. Look at those wonderful flags just being unfurled in the wind, patriotic and so picturesque, hence the photograph today. Great job today with everything Joshi. I hope you realize now why it 
deserved and warranted its own presentation. It's a tricky fix. More often than not, though, you will get away unscathed and maybe have one aircraft and cross draw sheet. You will get so used to having one aircraft, not having to worry about a cross draw sheet at 7 and 210, 7 and 210, 7 and 210. Then there's one fine day where you are met with a jungle gym of activity and everybody is pointed at Joshi and you have to figure it out. Know your canned headings, know the obstacles that you have to avoid, be aware of the factors of play that we've talked about today and you will do just fine. I have all the faith in the world that you will be able to negotiate these situations with all the tools that we have acquired up to this point. Thank you so much for spending time with me and watching the video and learning some things. I always learn something too whenever we rediscover and look into these situations. So believe me, it's just as much useful for you as it is for me. And I promise you not being disingenuous in saying that. Really appreciate our time together. Appreciate the focus, the drive. Cannot wait to have you guys start doing this yourselves. And you guys are going to perform wonderfully at that. I have no doubt in my mind. Steve here, wishing you nothing but the best. Have a fantastic day and keep those attitudes just like your separation positive. I'll see you at the next presentation. Bye now.